So before we begin uh, with our speakers today, I will introduce them. So Catherine has a bachelor's and a master's in education science. She is a PED uh, counselor since uh, 2019, uh, superior education. She is a teacher at Université de Sherbrooke. She is a TA at Université de Sherbrooke uh, and also Institute of Technology Agroalimentaire du Québec, the Agro uh, Food Institute of Quebec. She's also interested in technopedagogy and innovation in education. For Julien, after having taught French second language at Marianopolis for over 10 years, Julien became a pedagogical counselor at Institute of Technology at the Montréal du Québec, Saint Hyacinthe campus, uh, as well as Catherine, since 2022. As a teacher, he would uh, he loved to, to make his teachers read and uh, write his students, but make them think and uh, sharpen their critical thinking. For him, humor, creativity, and dialogue is very important in uh, pedagogy. So have a great webinar, everybody. I uh, will stop sharing my screen now and hand it over to Catherine and Julie. Thank you, Nicole. Very nice of you. Thank you also for being here with us so we can share what we've done at ITAQ. So I'm just going to introduce uh, really what we do and uh, Catherine will then uh, detail more specific objectives. So uh, we know that podcasts um, for the last 10 years are more and more significant uh, and take a, a more important place. So I've uh, really been hooked to that uh, to uh, podcasts. I really love that for about 10 years now. So we're going to show you how we've integrated podcasts into our teaching here uh, because uh, education is becoming more and more dem democratic and more uh, accessible to produce podcasts. So in education, it becomes a tool we can use that everybody can use as a teaching tool. So we're going to show you what we've done in the last year at ETEC. Yes, uh, so I'm going to talk about the objectives of the presentation today. So we want to recognize the benefits of the podcast for professional development of teachers. You'll see well, both of us are uh, pedagogical counselors, so we're looking at that from that angle. Of course, it's transferable into the classroom. We also, at the end, we are going to uh, give you a bit of a pedagogical perspective. Of course, that's the intention is to really show the benefits for teachers. And the second objective is to uh, create an institutional podcast or a classroom podcast. I'm going to give you the uh, tools and the steps to do that. So just to give you a little bit of an overview and talk about uh, all of this, we're going to give you um, a um, little bit of our podcast. It's about one minute. It's from uh, CP OPC. Catherine Gauthier. Hello, Julien. Can I say this? Can I say? You always start. I wanted to say that. You always begin. And you're right. Yes. Let's start again. Julien Martineau. Catherine Gauthier. How are you? I'm good. And you? I'm good. I'm good. I know we're not supposed to have a guest before next week, but we have a special guest today. Yes, we have an unexpected guest, a surprise guest today. Due to the apocalypse of the ice storm, everything is closed. So I brought my son with me and he's here. This is his first podcast. So that really shows the dedication of uh, pedagogical counselors who come uh, to uh, work risking their lives to record a podcast. So, yes, uh, so as you can see, the objective was uh, just to show you, just to give you a taste of uh, what we do, where uh, we really enjoy it. So we're going to share with you a more uh, pedagogical podcast later on. But um, for now, um, this is our game plan. So we will begin with the history. Then we will talk about the benefits because really it's uh, at the heart of our project is really the benefits. And we thought it was really uh, beneficial and positive. So we're going to talk about that. Then Julien will talk about the process, how we put together this project. 
and uh, what the tools uh, were that we used, and also the pedagogical perspectives, and then the conclusion. So uh, up uh, to you, Julien, go ahead. Thank you, Catherine. So we're going to do a little bit of a history of the origins of the project, how it began. It's very simple. In March last year, we were having pedagogical days at ITAQ, and Catherine and I gave a workshop on evaluation of uh, behavior, of how to, uh, how to act. So we did the presentation with some workshops, and we had some good questions on etiquette, and uh, we didn't really know about our answer, so we going to come back to that. Uh, so debrief about this code of behavior, and we're going to come back to you on that. So a few days later, we were at the office and we said, OK, we collected information. We wanted to uh, get some feedback and we wanted to write this email to give some feedback. Oh, no, not an email. Emails are so boring. So personally, I know that a mass email of more than one paragraph, I'm not really going to read it. So we had a great experience with uh, uh, the pet day we were having, and I said uh, as a joke with Catherine, uh, why don't we do podcasts? It'll be much more fun. We can do a mock podcast and send that. And I was surprised Catherine accepted. Good idea. Let's do that. So she jumped on this idea, and uh, we took a computer. We recorded with uh, the computer uh, recorder, the simple voice recorder on the computer. I think I did that uh, put together with the cheap uh, editing software. We did that uh, DIY. It was the first and last episode of our podcast, we said. But the response from the teachers were very positive. We got plenty of emails. People really liked it, and we uh, were asked to continue. So I had some material from the past, and that's how the project began. So the context at ITAC, I don't know if you know ITAQ, because uh, before I worked there, I didn't know what it was. But just to give you a bit of a picture, we have two campuses, one in saint yves saint one in the Rue We are uh, all technical training, no pre-university. So it's a domino effect. Quickly, we saw the positive effects. And among them, with the interest we had in saint yves saint the uh, team at Le Pocatière also decided to start their own uh, podcast project. So that's one of the things that surprised us. One of each campus has a, a podcast. We cover different subjects and we publish them one week apart. So it's accessible to everybody. We really concentrate on our people, but we have created some interest for uh, both campuses. Yes, uh, thank you. So as I said, we want to talk about the benefits uh, because uh, to our great surprise, it was very beneficial and positive. So the first the people who experienced it were the teachers. They were the ones we really wanted to get on board, and it really worked. As you can see the pictures here, we have two teachers, one manager and one uh, pedagogical counselor who came, and active services counselor who came as guests on our podcast. So we have a wall of fame and put their pictures up in Julien's office where our podcast studio is located. So it really was an interest right from the start for the teachers. The thing we noticed is the proximity and the contact we had with the teachers. And uh, it really opened a channel and a, a great communication because there were teachers that we really didn't discuss with before. We didn't talk about pedagogy with them before. They came to see us and asked us about these subjects that we had talked about uh, earlier. So we were surprised because it really opened the doors to more things and more communication. And we really liked uh, exchanging and talking with the with these colleagues. So we have a very funny and fun formula. We try to do it in a fun way and try to capture everybody. So you'll see that later with the podcast. These are really informal discussions, uh, so coffee table discussions. And so as Julien said, we are a technical institution. We have very technical, specific expertise. So we have experts on content. Our teachers are experts. But the pedagogical part of it is, is something that lacks sometimes. And we teachers really have uh, really could, could receive better training pedagogically. Not everybody, but some of them are very good. They got pedagogical training, but it's a minority. And so people need to, to improve that. So the podcast allows us to do that. And the formula we used that's very informal, and we really 
vulgarize everything, make it very um, easy and light and easy to digest and understand that everybody uh, can follow along. It's not very theoretical or technical. So the other solution is the lack of time. Um, so before at ETAC, what we were offering uh, is really a training program where we would offer three, four workshops per session that could last one, two, three hours. So it, it took a lot of time to uh, for the teachers to participate in the training. So what they were saying is they didn't have the time. And we saw that with the participation rate. We didn't have a huge participation uh, rate or a level of participation in our training. So what we're proposing then is an episode every two weeks between 10 and 20 minutes. They do this and uh, looking at their emails and uh, back and forth discussions and allowed us to uh, really send emails to our teachers so they can hear the podcast. So it really allowed us to uh, reach all the teachers. And another problem we have here at ETAC is we have a lot of teachers who are contractual. And so they are there uh, for a short while and uh, the uh, uh, the course is finished and they they finish too and they, and they at the same time with our students and they're not uh, available anymore they're somewhere else so the formula uh, allows us to really uh, connect with those teachers that we couldn't connect with before they we just send them a link to the podcast so it's it's really good for the teachers and they say it they really appreciate it and they uh, come back and say we should talk more about this or that subject that we covered in the past and so. It uh, also had some effects that uh, we didn't expect for us, the pedagogical, pedagogical counselors, to allow us to save time. As I said, we were offering a lot of uh, webinars of uh, training and uh, distance training or in-person training. Well, it requires a lot of time to put together a training program as a teacher or a pedagogical counselor. It requires a lot of time, a lot of effort, and putting together the material and uh, so we tr uh, do less uh, workshops but do better uh, uh, do a better job on them so it really allowed us to concentrate on podcasts we do that every two weeks so that allows us to save time it's uh, much less demanding to put together a podcast and one podcast episode than put together a training from uh, uh, the training module so it's asynchronous so uh, Julien will show you the platform we used to share our podcast so it stays so you can go back and listen to all the podcasts they're there so i went back and i listened to the podcast on evaluation and he needed a refresher so those episodes those podcasts are available and you can go back and listen to them so that also allows for professional development because we are constantly constantly uh, working to uh, for new episodes every two weeks we have a new theme we have to prepare new contact and I say us, but it, it's more me because yeah, is more the host and uh, he's uh, the person who tells anecdotes and tells jokes, and I'm the person who comes up with some content. And uh, uh, so uh, we uh, discuss the subject and prepare before the episode, of course, and that allows us to stay abreast of the uh, latest developments in pedagogy. So that allows us also to have a better knowledge of the need we develop the sensitivity and awareness of the needs because every two weeks we need a new subject. So of course, if we have teachers who uh, say hi to us in the corridor, in the hallway, I have this or that issue, and we say, okay, we're going to have that in our next podcast. We're going to talk about the uh, classroom management, for example. So we, yes, there's Patty. Kinsley, she says she doesn't remember the length of the episodes. They're 20 minutes. Yes, each episode are between 10 and 20 minutes. Sometimes we'll go up to 30. And uh, some episodes uh, that uh, have guests. But in general, we try to do 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I hadn't seen the question. So there you go uh, for uh, the needs that we cover. and. Also, it increased our participation rates in our training modules. So we do less training modules, but we do them better. We publicize them a bit more 
in our podcast because we always have a section in our podcast where we talk about events to come, training sessions that we are offering, and we try to get people interested. And when the people hear uh, the trainings, they come. And so that allowed us to uh, increase participation in our training modules. So the last uh, benefit we observed is the increase of collaboration. We started this in our campus in saint Saint, but uh, uh, ITAC also has a campus in La Focaccia, and our colleagues uh, in La Focaccia decided to follow and to do a ballot, uh, a podcast uh, in on their campus, and there's some uh, episodes where we work together and that allowed us uh, to have a better collaboration. So this also allowed the collaboration with other professionals like uh, uh, the Adaptive Services Advisor, Counselor, and other professionals who come as guests uh, to our podcast. So we thought it was really great to have this exchange and collaboration. So that concludes the advantages. Now I will hand it over to Julien for the process. Thank you. Catherine, for having talked about I do nothing except some humor and levity. But uh, now, for the process, um, we followed a simple process. We started by determining a need or an objective that for us was very clear. So we wanted to communicate uh, pedagogical information in a quick and concise uh, way, and a popular way. So this really influenced the format, the style, and everything that followed. So our objective was to connect with people in a relaxed way. Um, uh, and once we knew that uh, things would uh, work and it was going fairly well and our humor and podcasts uh, interested people, we did a little test and uh, we will try and we'll apologize later. That's how we manage things. So we didn't ask for permission from anybody. We didn't go and knock on any doors to ask for permission to do a podcast. We were lucky. I had the material. We did one. We sent it to the teachers. It uh, took off, and then it uh, was a fait accompli. We have uh, a podcast at Intac. It uh, works. It's great. Uh, wonderful. So I don't know how much you are comfortable to bend some rules, but for us, it worked out well. So uh, it's also internally, this is something that is internal consumption only. So it was not a real problem. So also choosing the format. we talked about uh, something pretty short, 10, 15, 20 minutes, sometimes more when we have guests. For the frequency, in the beginning, we were very excited. We had them every week. And it allowed us to quickly understand the scope of what we wanted to do, the format, make uh, some changes. And I think long term, it wasn't viable. So we decided to do it every two weeks, which allowed us to have a time between episodes to have a bank of subjects that will last longer and not create an overabundance or tire the teachers. Every two weeks, it works out great. And for the platform, we do it in SharePoint. So I'm going to show you that later on. And something that really helped is to create a calendar and to respect the calendar most of the time. So Catherine, if you just want to click on the little plus there, thank you. So this is what our calendar looks like. The beginning of the session, we meet. And at the beginning of the semester, we record. We decide when we want to record. So we publish the episodes on the Friday so that it's uh, weekend listening and it's uh, fun for everybody. So we uh, choose the uh, weeks that we want to record and we look at the uh, schedule and we uh, have potential subjects or guests, things we might want to work on. But it's not a contract. It's a bank of ideas. And then oh, well, there's this thing coming. It would be good to have an episode on this subject. We'll do the episode we want to do later. So we give us ourselves some space and we uh, can jazz it up and we don't really have to follow. We can change it up if we want to. And some episodes are done 10 minutes before we record. Okay, let's talk about this today. Okay, let's do it. So it uh, doesn't always happen that way, but it, it, it works out well sometimes. So that's uh, our uh, calendar. And then Catherine um, uh, really said that we do things punctually. We adjust to what's going on. There's a lot of teachers that were talking about uh, classroom management, and we hadn't planned to do anything about uh, on that subject, but we, we were talking about it with some teachers, and uh, teachers asked us to, uh, to talk about that. So we uh, did an episode on that. When we see that there's a need, we adjust, and 
That's why the teachers uh, see that it's a relevant tool for them. So I see here there's a question. What were the motivations to decide that the podcast stays internal? That's a very good question. The first thing is in not asking permission, we don't bother uh, people as much. Internally, we don't have to worry about uh, PR and external communications because we're going to talk about ETAC and what ETAC is all about and all that. So it's really between our walls here, the four walls of ETAC. So the other point uh, was a bit my punchline, so I'm going to keep that to the end. But if I don't answer, you can come back with this question. It's a very important point. It's uh, simpler. Uh, but there's another aspect also that is quite beneficial. So you can change uh, uh, slides, Captain. So the style and the material, if you have any questions on the material, don't be shy. You want to put this on the Q and A. So uh, we will go with the second clip. This one is a bit longer, a bit more serious. So to give you the context, Christian Merci, one of our teachers who had brought us to participate, he wanted to talk about silence as a pedagogical tool and present articles he had read. So I uh, will play it for you now. Is it necessarily because no I. Talk about the lecture. There's often students who are silent. Is it negative? Uh, is silence a negative thing? Are there teachers who don't, uh, uh, students who don't talk much and who are learning and who are still active in their mind? Or because we have to, we have this idea that to learn, we have to speak, we have to answer questions, ask questions. Is it always necessary? Can the student be silent and still learn very well? Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. So that's why uh, this idea of this subject today, not because the student is silent, that he's not uh, learning. And I think as a teacher, we have to respect that. We have to respect the right to not talk too much. So you're talking about Michel Sartange's article, and uh, he said he's ahead of his time. And I, I read this, and it's the reform of 97 approach by skill set. And he was ahead of the curve. And this idea that uh, defies this idea. So I teach, I speak, so I learn, or I speak, so I teach. So he's questioning this idea of silence and listening and how active listening can be something uh, uh, very active. Listening can be active. We learn in classes. We learn uh, by uh, discussion between students because there's always a question of teacher, but it's not just discussion with the teacher. It's letting the students speak to each other, discuss, and then listening to what they say. So he's breaking this model that we had before. So a teacher that uh, asks questions is a teacher, as a student that is invested, a student that asks questions is the one who participates. But it's not true always. It's sometimes students are, are silent. And, but I'll go further. Just because a teacher doesn't speak, that he's not teaching. When you think about it, the usage of silence as a pedagogical tool is great. So a lot of people are listening. They're co doing corrections while they listen to this podcast. and. And then um, the silence that I just uh, gave brought back the attention of the people listening that were expecting to have information. And I interrupt the flow of information voluntarily. And that uh, makes our colleagues uh, that are correcting uh, papers while listening to us. So we're probably listening to this on the weekend because it's a Friday. Oh, you just broke the magic. People think that we record this on the Friday and we publish it right away. And they think we're doing it live. And so I see I chose the clip. I wanted to choose one where I look good. So but you can see the general tone. We go between serious and humor. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to uh, not be too dry or to be a symposium. We wanted to make it more accessible and have uh, some questions and discussions. Our structure is very simple. We have an intro, a bit of a, uh, a, a intro music. Then we will have the subject we want to talk about. Then we finish with the uh, billboard where we plug different activities. And uh, that's where me and Catherine, it's a bit of a running gag between us. I say she doesn't uh, speak uh, French with the uh, uh, Great rigor. She has English. Uh, she uses a lot of English words, and she, and Catherine says I don't. Oh, uh, uh, I'm not always serious, and so it's just joking around creates this proximity, and we're very spontaneous. And 
that's very uh, important for us because for us when we click on record we don't stop until we're done we sometimes we'll make mistakes but we don't stop the recording we just record everything and then we'll uh, fix it in the editing but uh, we leave ourselves a lot of uh, space and uh, we can go in different directions. And if we decide to keep it, we keep it. If not, we don't. So it makes the process a lot lighter. It's not uh, uh, a difficult task. It's something we like to do. We just have fun with it. We record and then we just have fun and we see what comes out. So different types of episodes. We have three types. There's the classics where we talk about very specific subjects like uh, uh, evaluation tables, correction, AI in education. We have others where we have guests. So we're talking about CUI with Mireille Chabot, which is our uh, counselor here. We have Christian who came to talk about silence. We have Jean Sebastien who talked about research and education. And sometimes we will have lighter subjects where we do top five on different tools. We have uh, uh, some uh, quizzes on the different questions that uh, we want to develop. So class management, for example, classroom management uh, and uh, how we uh, will react to different situations. That's uh, the portrait of our episodes in general. So you can see they are shared on SharePoint. Um, I will talk about that later. So, and finally, our audio signature. We, this is, I do the editing and um, Catherine did it once and I wasn't satisfied. So I always do it now. But it's very simple. We have a little uh, intro uh, uh, music. And often what I will do is I will uh, inject some sound effects to make it punchy. To, to maybe talk about a joke or a gag. Or we, we're talking about inverse pedagogy. And we're talking about the posture of the teacher. And not because you do magistrate, you're in the Pays de Caleb and Marina Arsini. And, that I put the intro of Marina Orsini and the Ifi de Caleb in the uh, podcast. So these are little gags like that that support and doesn't take up too much space and it's fun to do. So that's our style in general. And uh, how long does it take to do the editing after the recording? Less and less long, less and less time. I had done podcasts in the past, so my learning curve was, I was pretty comfortable. I know how to use the tools, but no, uh, to record, takes what 25 minutes 30 minutes then when we press on record and we don't keep everything and then uh, when i do the editing the uh, 15 the time of recording plus 20 minutes so 45 minutes maybe an hour to uh, do the editing because i know in general what i'm keeping and what i'm taking out and my job when i do the editing is especially taking out uh, things and uh, putting in the beginning and end in uh, music so it's really easy and pretty pretty easy but uh has to remain simple because we have to work on this and don't have uh, a huge amount of time usually we do it all in one afternoon so i hope that answers uh, your question so the material i did a bit of an expose on uh, an exposition on this la Pétain does it with almost nothing i think it's a recorder a digital recorder one uh uh, Mike, for everybody, Catherine and I, we had some uh, um, electronics that I had from before. So it's not that expensive. Uh, so uh, it's not necessary to have all of it, but we have uh, a recording uh, microphones for uh, two separate microphones. Uh, when there are three or four around the table, we have three or four microphones. It, the advantage is I can manage the sound of each person and isolate each microphone, which is complicated sometimes when you record with one microphone and um, it uh, maybe somebody speaks louder than the others, somebody is further from the mic, then if you want to have a better sound, every time the person talks, you have to go and adjust the volume and that's um, difficult. So Catherine always speaks too loud. She's too close to her mic. So when I do the editing, I move her down a bit and uh, I fix the levels but microphones come in different prices price, price ranges on the bottom uh, right is sm58 that's the workhorse of microphones indestructible a very uh, good value 150 dollars and there are 85 and 75 dollar microphones that are almost as good so you don't need to have a super professional microphone on the left that's audio technica 
that's a microphone uh, with a condenser. It's a condenser mic. It's a bit more sensitive and that will need electric power. It's a bit technical, but uh, we have that as well. But that's really a luxury. We didn't need it, but we had these microphones already. So what's practical, but not necessarily these microphone stands. So when we record, I'm a very um, professional. Uh, Catherine would say obsessive, but I like uh, less noise when I record. So Catherine, um, I'm picking on you, but she touches the table, she makes noise. So with a, a microphone stand, you don't hear that as much. So it's very uh, good for that. But the most important thing is on the left. This is a small sound console, which is called the PodTrack, and it's very, very useful. So what this does is you will have the four sources of microphones and uh, headphones, and I can adjust everybody's sound. And I don't know if you see A, B, C, D. I have uh, sound effects that I can use during my episodes. So if I have some intro music, I can put it there or uh, a bit of a gag sound or any sound effects, I can put them there and I don't have to add them. They're rare, right there, ready to use live. So those little things are really useful. And uh, just to give you an idea of price, uh, I don't want to do any publicity to Amazon, but it's about $200. So it's really useful and it's portable. We're using it in a fixed uh, location, but you can take it anywhere you want, and it's made for that. It was made for podcasts, and it um, allows us to do a whole bunch of things. And for editing, I will cover that in a few seconds. But to, it really, could, we can could even have people outside, and you could be on Teams and uh, connect to a computer and have the person phone in on Teams and with the conversation as, as if they're there. So it's a, a pretty a good deal for $200, if you ask me. So uh, if you go to editing here, what I use is Audacity. It's a software that's uh, pretty popular. The main advantage is that it's free and uh, it's open source. So it's really accessible. It's really easy to use. I think you know, once you understand the main tools, volume, cut and paste and things like that, it's uh, not that hard to use. So because it's op open source, there's a lot of modules you can add. So if you're somebody who's very much a perfectionist and you want more uh, control and more tools and processing and stuff, but you can add that. But the main advantage is that it's free and there's a lot uh, of uh, uh, stuff online to help you fix your problems. You can go do a search on YouTube and you can have somebody uh, explain how to use Audacity and uh, if you have any problems. So does that answer your question? Yes, I imagine so. So, Catherine, you uh, can now uh, complain about me like I complained about you. Well, you were complaining about me quite a bit. Well, I want to talk about the pedagogical possibilities because as we said in the beginning of the webinar, we really uh, took a perspective which is more of a, a pedagogical counselor because we are pedagogical counselors. We our objective was to share our experience. But following the uh, broadcast of our podcast, there are two teachers who uh, uh, said that they integrated the podcasts into their classroom. And um, of course, it's a, a very specific usage that they do, very pedagogical. But GDA did this uh, when he uh, uh, was a teacher in his past life. He was doing this in his classroom. So we thought that it was a usage that was really interesting, a really interesting way to use it. So we wanted to share that as well in, in terms of different ways of using the classroom. So first, when is the inverted classroom? So everybody knows what that is. So it, it's been a few years that it's an approach that is very popular. So it's a pedagogy, uh, 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 active pedagogy approach. And it allows us to give theory, to uh, inculcate theory, but in a, in a different way. So students sometimes, uh, the more uh, theoretical courses, uh, it's more difficult for them. So it's a way to give uh, theoretical, uh, to give content and with a podcast that the teacher puts together or a teacher that wants to get some episodes, to get episodes of podcasts on all kinds of subjects. I thought, uh, I found a podcast on how to uh, 
do arts and crafts with my child. So there's all kinds of different podcasts that exist. And uh, so it uh, makes everything more fun, more lighthearted. And the platforms, you know, the decide to do it yourself, it's very accessible. The platforms you can use are often free. We uh, tried to do this internally only. So we uh, use the tools that we already had uh, internally, but you can um, easily share it with the, the public. One of the, the other ways to use it is, um, the teachers uh, use it here, is to make it into a project. So it allows the students to have choices. So they can uh, choose uh, it's differentiation in Syria. And so these are the good practices. And you can easily substitute that for an oral presentation. So we know that right now with performance anxiety, it's a subject that uh, we see often. And the oral presentations are something uh, that causes anxiety for many students. So it can be an alternative that we offer the students. And it uh, really works well. And so also, Scientific vulgarization, that's part of the skills of many programs is to vulgarize things and to uh, make it in, uh, everything into layman's terms. So really, uh, it's part of what Gigi and I do in our podcast, we read articles and digest them, and we share them in a way that's easy to understand and lighthearted. And, and we can, so, of course, for the teachers, it allows a, a gain of time. It allows us to save a lot of time, and it's also more fun to correct to hear our students instead of always reading. So it um, really is fun for the teachers as well. So of course, it connects with the skills we want to promote from the 21st century, using technology, communication, creativity. It really uh, touches all these aspects. The other pedagogical usage is the interview or discussion. So the teacher or the student who will interview an expert or have a discussion with somebody who has a, a job that they want to do in the future. To be very, it's very interesting, but also for sharing with other students. So it can really be a great way to uh, capture expertise outside the classroom. And of course, if you want to go further, if something that's uh, interesting for you to do podcasts, the Cadre 21 training is offered. Uh, offers it. It's pretty complete. So it's a step by step training. I think Julien did it. And I looked at it, but I didn't complete it. I watched it. But I'm just putting it there as a reference because it's a pretty complete training for people who want to start doing this. So uh, also, the, one of the teachers that did the podcast project, she received them last Friday and I uh, met with her and she said it was very positive. The students really liked it. And they had followed the training Cadvetier and the tools and proposed by Cadvetier. So it uh, seems like a great experience. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So we are ready, are coming to the end. So, Julien, I will let you uh, do that. So, thank you, Kathir. I'm going to ask the question from the beginning Why do we do this internally versus on Spotify? And we could do that easily and make it publicly accessible, but it's to make our lives more simple, to not have to go through asking permission and uh, verifying everything we say and uh, vetting everything for public consumption. So the answer is, my opinion here, is that we often have a tendency to validate a podcast by the platforms it is available on, on the number of listeners, the number of um, followers to give it some uh, gravitas, if you will. So the, for Kathleen and me, it's the contrary. The advantage of our podcast is we talk to our gang, our people. So it's this proximity and the fact that we speak directly to them. There's one teacher who uh, met with me in the hallway one day and she said, a Friday, I go and listen to my podcast and it, it's like you're talking to me personally. So that's the advantage of our podcast. It's very proximal. It's very personal and with our group. And so if we made it public, we'd have to dilute that and make compromises. When we do the podcast, we name teachers. We have running gags. We talk about their programs. We all know each other. So I could make jokes on Tipitura, but nobody else will know what I mean. So GPRA with Grecou, nobody knows what that is. But our people, 
our gang knows what that is. And there's all kinds of inside jokes. And we have this discussion, this community between us. And that's a great advantage. So that's why we chose to keep it limited, to keep it internal, to keep it small. And allows us to go further, faster, and be closer to our people. And to have better discussions with them. Yes, that was excellent. Great. So we don't have the outro music. It would have been good to have the uh, uh, the exit music. But uh, anyway, we're finishing. Now we have a question from Julien. What do you recommend for a college that would like to podcast, but there's no soundproof studio to record? And so we have some places that are uh, we can record, but there's a lot of echo, and it's uh, difficult to find space in the college uh, to uh, record a podcast. Well, yes, uh, Julien, do you want to answer? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so for having been in that situation, sometimes noise is not as significant as you think as, as far as problems go, HVAC and all that. Uh, in my old life, we didn't have any specific space for that. We would rent one. Sometimes there were students in the hallways, and but it was pretty minimal, the background noise. And so and sometimes we would go uh, during times where it was less busy. So I think you'd be surprised how much uh, sometimes you can avoid those problems and how you can manage them. I think that uh, what I would advise is instead of having a location dedicated to that, to have a room for that, maybe find a place that's a bit uh, far away from that. Sometimes the sound can be easy to manage that way, just to go somewhere in a corner, somewhere more quiet and with less noise. And it could still work. Even if there's a bit of noise, it's okay. So uh, your your studio is in your office, Julie. It's not, we don't have a uh, room just for that. Sometimes we record and we hear our colleagues and who are in the background and who are speaking. And honestly, our material is uh, okay. We have uh, microphones and our, uh, uh, our uh, equipment that helps us to manage sound. So when where can we get the podcast training that was mentioned? Well, this is the Cadre 21 training in Genially. We have a link there uh, that leads to the training. Um, um, uh, we'll share that in the chat. It's in the chat there for everybody. And so um, the he uh, apologized for his spelling mistakes, but that's okay, no problem. So thank you, Catherine Julian. That was excellent. I didn't think that it was. I didn't. I knew. It, I knew it was preparation, some work, but I didn't know it was so much fun and so fluid, to, easy to do a podcast. I thought it was much more complex. I know it could become more complex, but I think you have uh, uh, pared it down to the important part of it to uh, send a message to communicate with your people, your group, and you do it in a really fun way uh, and informal and uh, light-hearted and. Uh, that's uh, probably what makes your podcasts uh, so much appreciated and so much fun for everybody. So I find that very encouraging. And I think it would be a great project between pedagogical counselors. Uh, bravo, 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 really. It's uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I just saw in the chat there was a question. Um, I think we already answered. What tools do you use for? The uh, editing. Yes, we answered that. Oh, that's it. So I would invite the participants to go and uh, write their comments. That will take about three uh, seconds. And uh, for us, that's uh, very useful. It was clear, concise, a lot of fun. And I hope uh, to uh, meet with you again. And I'm convinced that everybody appreciated and enjoyed today. So uh, I think. Uh, the uh, accolades are coming into the chat, so you will see all of them. Uh, we will send uh, the chat to everybody. So I'm going to stay a few seconds to allow people to give you their comments. And uh, in the meantime, I will let you have lunch, and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.